Okay, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the program. I am your host, Patrick Penry. My real name is Tony Muga. You know me as Patrick Penry on my YouTube channel and my WordPress blog. And before I get into the NRC Freedom of Information documents tonight, which has been my ongoing project, I would like to bring some light to a, a three, actually, three WordPress blogs um, that are really critical blogs that you need to know about. You need to go visit and spend some time there, and they're pertaining to the weather modification and atmospheric aerosols. And this is particularly worrisome right now. Recently, we had Sandy hit the East Coast, and there are a number of problems with nuclear plants, including a discharge, which they assured us was insignificant radiation levels, nothing to worry about, as usual. There's never anything other than minuscule amounts ever detected. But not to get distracted, the first WordPress blog is Harold Saeed's blog, and it's Kim Trails Planet. That's one word, Kim trailsplanet.net, N-E-T. And it's a WordPress blog, and, and he's just redone it recently. It's really nice tonight, and it's really on top of things with these covert deployment. In fact, it says right on the front page, geoengineering exposed weather modification by covert deployment of atmospheric aerosols. And indeed, that is an ongoing problem right now. We see these hurricanes intensifying and historically, they've been doing it since the 60s and 70s with Project Storm Fury and other operations done by NOAA and DOD and other elements of the government. In fact, Harold's exposed a number of old declassified documents that show the budget from back in the late 60s with the DOD and other agencies or sometimes the Department of Agriculture, even if you go back far enough, we're getting the millions of dollars. And that was back in the 60s. So imagine that once it becomes effective and they're making progress, the money is you know, greatly increased. Now the second WordPress blog I would point you to is another excellent one by Resonate, and it's the Resonation. And this one, if you want to find it, you can type in R-E-Z-N with a number 8-D, R-E-Z-N with a number 8-D dot N-E-T net resonate.net, and it should take you to the Resonation. It's got a picture of the Toxic Avenger right on the front page. I mean, I'm telling you, folks, that, you know, Toxic Avenger means so much more to me now looking back at it from when I was a teenager watching the nerd get thrown out of the second-story building in the library by the football jocks, and he lands into the dump truck full of radioactive waste, you know, and then, I mean, the rest is history, folks. So, not to get distracted, but go to the resonation, and this guy's on top of it, too. He's a really nice person, too. I've watched a couple of his interviews, and great, nice person, excellent um, activist, and very knowledgeable. Very, some of these guys, in fact, all of these guys know a lot more than I do, especially in this area of weather modification and, and harp and that kind of stuff. So I'm the generalist, so I try to draw from all areas and take it as much. I kind of specialize right now in the FOIA documents, but I'm open to anything. And the last website I would point you to is the one and only famous Dutch Sense, or this one is Sense Dutch. It's a WordPress blog, and if you type in Sense, S-I-N-C-E-D-U-T-C-H, Sense Dutch, at WordPress.com, that takes you right to his site. And he's the original one that got me started, and a lot of people in uh, cataloging these um, anomaly, VLF anomalies on Intellicast and other online uh, weather websites. So I want to point those three out rather than me rush right into a program on this ongoing weather modification and manipulation of hurricanes in particular. Uh, I will refer you to these three sites. And if you look through these, <clears throat> spend a, a modicum of time studying their articles and getting to know what they've got posted up, you will become a near expert. It's not going to take much for you to understand the basic principles and then be able to use that to inform other people and send them to these. Again, it's, they're all WordPress blog sites. And looking at, at it, I think to myself, here's the revolution that's going on on the WordPress blogs, on these little small independent sites. If you really look around, they're willing to talk about anything. OK, now I want to open up my document. I've done some screen captures. And this one I went over before. I don't think I completed it, but like I, I said, I want to come back with a new focus 
and systematically eliminate each one of these documents in full at the same time screen capturing, posting to the Uncovering uh, Plumegate blog, which we have on WordPress also. And so at the same time, you can look along as I go over these documents. And indeed, tonight I have that posted up. And there's a link from my blog talk radio program for tonight. If you just click on that, it will take you to the Uncovering Plumegate blog. And you can follow along in the document or series of screen captures from the document. OK, we'll dig right in with my first screen capture. This is an 86-page document. And this is a series of screen captures through a number of dates up through like March and even into April. And it's kind of in chronological order. So let me dig right in. This first screen capture is a couple of emails where they're basically talking about what they're going to information they're considering appropriate for Congress. And the first email. <clears throat> the guy is talking about a rough draft. In the second email, the response from Weber Michael is, thanks, thinking about the level of detail that might be appropriate for a daily one-page summary of current status for Congress. You might consider something like the following. Again, the second screen capture is this emergency response update from March 18th. And this is what he's talking about. This is what is appropriate for Congress. And this doesn't mean much at first looking at this by itself, but once you get the overall picture and you see by the time we get through these screen captures, you'll see it's very important because this has to do with the channeling of information and the control of information. In my second screen capture, I've highlighted this section at the bottom. It says, NRC is cooperating with DOE, Department of Energy, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and NOAA and other agencies in conducting radioactive plume modeling and assessing radioactive contamination within Japan. And if you notice, that's critical, that within Japan. I didn't think about that earlier, but saying that now, that's, you know, each word is critical. If you think back to George Orwell's, he wrote a paper, The Politics of the English Language, or something like that, which is exactly what we're talking about here, a single word can change the whole intention, can subvert the intent, or change the intent. And contamination within Japan, this is what is approved for our congressmen. And here, here you go. This is what will easily gift you no problem. Maybe if you have special connections, a congressman gets a call from someone and is given inside information. But if not, this is the standard what you're going to get. This is what they will allow the congressmen. So they're not very specific about contamination leaving uh, Japan which should be a priority. OK, on the next screen capture, the very top I have highlighted, the NRC is providing technical assistance to the government of Japan on alternative strategies to restore and maintain cooling of the reactors and spent fuel pools in collaboration with the DOE, Department of Energy, DOD, Department of Defense, DOS. I'm not entirely certain what that is. I'm still trying to get information on that and private sector entities. And the bottom, I have a section highlighted where it, it talks about this official use only to be shared within the federal family. OK, and again, at the top, what we're looking at here is this collaboration. We're looking for evidence of who all is working together. Because we know historically what happens when there's a meltdown. So what we want to see is who's working together. We know there's suppression. We know there's a cover-up. Who all is involved? I try to see groups of people that at some point will say they're collaborating, working together, trying to stay aligned, that kind of thing. OK, the next screen capture I'm labeled as Daiichi status, March 18. It's a nice colored um, graphic here. You can see and look at the condition as of March 18th. Again, TEPCO is not being honest, but you have to understand the whole nuclear industry is not honest. I mean, so let's not. Let's not pick on TEPCO. None of them are going to be honest completely with us. And you see cases inside these documents where some people want to be honest, but that is quickly suppressed. And to a large extent, they're very careful to downplay the severity of this multiple meltdown, including a mock fuel. Uh, number three was a mock fuel reactor. And this one, you can indeed see that the unit three, which is the mock fuel mixed oxide, plutonium uranium, 
uh, it shows red. The others are yellow and green, and this one is red. And RCS depressurization, radiation released, it says. Primary containment, some damage. Secondary containment, loss. So we know right now on March 18th, for sure, they knew the Unit 3 <laughs> catastrophic damage, and there had been there had been release of radiation. That's a fact. We now know that 1, 2, and 3 all melted down. So at that time, why were there not immediately, if you knew that at that time, we should have been getting wa warnings, rainwater warnings, some kind of basic standard warning like other countries, Taiwan, France, and other countries indeed did. Next screen capture, I've titled Flyovers in the White House. Let me read the highlighted section to you. It says at 0550 EDT, March 14, 2011, the NRC experts in Japan reported that the Japanese have requested U.S. technical assistance with cooling the Fukushima Daiichi units as needed. The effort is being coordinated by the ambassador. At 0900 EDT, March 15, 2011, the Japanese government accepted DOE's Radiological Assistance Program, RAP. I'll be able to write that down, RAP. Team assistance, which includes aerial measuring system, AMS, aerial measuring system, flyovers. I'm putting together also, quickly let me note, a, a list of acronyms and definitions of which I will include these two, the RAP, Radiological Assistance Program, and the Aerial Measuring System, AMS. And I will post that also on Uncovering Plumegate WordPress blog. For any Plumegate researchers that want to go on these documents, which are wide open, thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of stuff nobody has ever read before. Pretty incriminating stuff, too, if you ask me. So I will post that up, and you'll be able to look at definitions and acronyms. So don't be afraid to dig in if you're not sure what it means. I'll try to give you layman's terms, because I'm just learning a lot of this myself as well. Okay, it goes on to say, on March 16, NRC provided the White House with information on protective measures for NRC staff in Japan and information to provide advice for other federal workers in Japan. The current protective action recommendation for U.S. citizens residing within 50 miles of the Fukushima Daiichi site is to evacuate. So again, here's evidence at 16. The White House is being provided with information. There's contact back and forth. White House is heavily involved. At the end of this document, by the time you read through it, you're really convinced more than ever just the intense level of control White House has over everything. Anything and everything could hinge on the White House approval, ultimately. Keep that in mind. And so the fact all this information of the plume and the fallout has been suppressed, you know, we, we know it goes as far as the White House. There's no mention of Obama in here. He carefully lays the blame at the feet of the NRC and CDC and other experts as his famous speech is becoming famous now. Let me go to the next clip, or screen capture, I should say. This one I have titled DOE EPA Lead on Domestic. And the highlighted section I have reads, the U.S. Department of Energy and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency are the federal communicators on questions regarding possible domestic impacts from the events in Japan and on domestic monitoring. Now, folks, if you're not knowledgeable about what happens in a meltdown with a fallout and plume, you need to become so. And you need, when you do your research, keep in mind that the institutions and foundations and a lot of these colleges, the information there is tainted because money trades hands and they're beholden to these industries. So you're not going to get a completely honest story. It's going to be a little bit diluted, a little bit distorted. You want to keep that in mind and search for the small independent outlets and, and get information from them. There's plenty of them out there. They're not making a lot of money. You can tell their website's not super fancy compared to the others. And you know, Just keep that in mind. Money buys scientists. But you need to understand that in all of these meltdowns, there's a plume is released and there's radiological effect that's inescapable. In this instance, it was a multiple meltdown. And there's even a jet stream that flows from Japan over here. So the fact we were not warned is just that in, in and of itself is all the evidence I need to know. I don't need to, to take that seriously, their estimates in these rooftop grabs, because there's evidence. One guy says, here's what we give the, our workers inside the nuclear plant, and here's the information I'm going to forward you up the line chain of command. So the nuclear plant gets its own special brief, which 
in my opinion, I'm certain they're downplaying these estimates. And besides, they're what, checking for iodine or cesium or something with a relatively short half-life. I think iodine is like eight days or something. So that's what they're testing for, not plutonium or some other substance that would have a much longer half-life. So keeping that in mind. And here's the evidence, Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, lead communicators on domestic impacts. And look, what, what did we get? What warnings did we get? OK, the next screen capture. I have titled Unit 3 and Majority of Releases Carried Out to Sea. And I'll read to you the box section I have in red. NHK Media Report on March 17, 0100, EDT, I believe it's Eastern Daylight Time, stated that helicopter crews dumping water on Unit 3 reactor building reported dose rates at 375 rems an hour at 300 feet above the building. An array of fire trucks have been deployed at the site and appear to be supplying slash spraying water over Unit 3. All available information indicates that the majority of releases from the Fukushima site have been carried out to sea by the prevailing winds. Forecast meteorological data for the 24-hour period until 2000 Eastern Daylight Time on March 18, 2011, indicates wind headed offshore from the northwest slash westerly. Now, I will draw your attention to the fact it says from the northwest. That means it's blowing from that direction, which means it would be generally in a southeast direction. And all we need to know is it's going to flow east to us. And if you look at the plume models later and the leaked plume models, we now know and we can see the effects of where the radiation went and what kind of radiation we got hit with. And it was quite severe, I assure you. OK, the next screen capture is about flyovers in Unit 1, 2, and 3. And I'll just pay, pay particular attention to Unit 3, although we'll look at some of these bundles and the fuel pools and so you can get an idea what these places are storing. I won't get to it tonight, the Robert Alvarez study on the spent fuel pools here in the United States, but we will go over that in great detail uh, quite soon so you can realize the seriousness of our spent fuel pool situation here. The DOE aerial measurement teams have completed two flyovers of the Daiichi site. NRC has received the data and the analysis from the first flyover. Data from the second flyover was received by DOE and is being analyzed. And that's important to note because you see DOE is heavily involved. They're doing a lot of aerial flyovers. And you can't tell me they don't have the equipment to really give them a good idea of what's really seriously going on. But you can imagine whoever's taking these initial samples and, and radiation levels is probably quite shocked to find out what is really being released from there because this is no Chernobyl, ladies and gentlemen. This is not a 10% of Chernobyl, like they try to say in some of these documents, that's a laughable downplay estimate, a ridiculous, laughable, absurd downplay of the reality. Okay, this is a multiple reactor melt. And the when one that was critically hit was the number three with a mock fuel. And clearly in the documents, we see that the number four, which is the spent fuel pool with the largest number of bundles and the largest number of fuel rods, has lost almost all the fuel to the point where the flyover by the Japanese, the Japanese are trying to say, we see a glimmer of water on the bottom. We see a glimmer of water on the bottom. I think as Chuck Castro says, I, I don't see any of that crap. He's saying, I think that that's a paraphrasing, but he, he says something like, I don't see that crap at all. You know, So they're, they're trying to downplay that. And we know that the spent fuel pools, when they lose water, it's quite serious. And the number of microcuries released is incredible. So. We don't want to downplay that like they did. And this, the information is, is clear in these documents if you want to look. Remember, they're, they're downplaying their rooftop grabs. But we take our science combined with the mortality studies. And that's the, the reality is the people that are dying and the people that will get cancer in the years to come. Okay, so you can see here on Unit 3, it says primary containment status unknown. Well, we know to the earlier thing, I believe that was from the 18th, the next day, a day later, I should say, that they know that, that there was a breach of containment and the release of radiation. In the Unit 1, 292 bundles in pool, fuel, spent fuel pool bundles. Unit 2, 587 bundles in pool. Unit 3, 514 bundles in pool. And in the next screen capture, Unit 4, 1,201 bundles in pool. And that was because my understanding is they 
it was dry, it was empty, they were getting ready to refuel or do something where the fuel rods had been removed. And that's also my understanding is a very dangerous situation. When you read the Robert Alvarez study, you find out that as far as spent fuel pools, they're not required to have any kind of a backup cooling or what have you. And we'll go into that in great detail, although I did give a link to that on the blog radio post that I posted up today. You can follow that and go ahead and look into that in the meantime. So it's very dangerous. We've got a number of those over here, and uh, 1,201 bundles. That's quite a lot, and I think that pales in comparison to, I'm not sure, I don't want to say which one it is, but I know we've got another one over here, and it's listed in the Alvarez study right off the bat. Now, maybe we will get to that tonight. There's one over here that's got a lot more that we really need to worry about, Mark 1 containment, too. So Unit 5, 950 bundles. Unit 6, 876. Now, Unit 5 and Unit 6 didn't suffer damage like the others, but they all had uh, trouble, and they were all affected by the earthquake and tsunami to some degree, mostly the earthquake, I should say. In the bottom, there's mention of the common spent fuel pool. 6,000 bundles in the common spent fuel pool. Electrical power, NRC, priority 7, restoration from switchyard to unit 2, 40 volts in progress. So they're trying to restore power. You know, when you read through these documents, you see just how long they were without power. And then when you study and see what happens over certain amounts of time when they're without power and without proper cooling, you really begin to see just how serious it was. And the fact we didn't receive any warnings at all while other countries did is very telling. Okay, the next screen capture I've titled DOE Lead and CF, CCM-137 Deposition. And I've underlined a section at the top that says, therefore NRC has the responsibility to develop source terms and dose projections within Japan up to 50 miles from the reactor site, while DOE, the Department of Energy, has the lead for dose projections beyond 50 miles and for the United States and territories. Again, DOE is very incriminated in this, that they're you know, beneath the White House, in my opinion. They, it looks like they're going to be second or maybe third, but probably second in command here, where ultimately you are beholden to DRE, and they're making sure everyone's aligned and trying to get in touch and contact and send their guys out to NRC. You know, I like NRC better than the DOE, no doubt about it. And I don't like the NRC at all, so that's saying something. Okay, the next section I have highlighted, the source term provided to NARAC, remember NARAC does the plume modeling and fallout modeling, was, number one, 25% of the total fuel in Unit 2 released to the atmosphere. Number two, 50% of the total spent fuel from Unit 3 was released to the atmosphere, and three, 100% of the total spent fuel was released to the atmosphere from Unit 4. All 96-hour dose projections, Alaska, Hawaii, West Coast, are well below the one rem total effective dose protective action guide based on predicted cesium-137 deposition. Again, cesium, and a very low ball number. Except for Alaska, all thyroid dose estimates are well below the EPA 5 rem protective action guidelines. Before I forget, folks, let me just say this. If it's such a low number, and in these documents they say that Fukushima has estimated only 10% of Chernobyl, then if we got rainwater warnings from Chernobyl in Oregon and rainwater warnings, I believe Michigan, but a couple other states for Chernobyl, and it was such a less, lesser amount, then clearly here again is the cover-up and the downplay and my proof of that. I mean, by their own admission, they're, they're busted liars and you know hypocrites a million times over, but nothing they say makes any sense when you really look at it. If it's so low and so small, well, they say Chernobyl was 10%, or this was, this was 10% of Chernobyl. So that doesn't make any sense at all. You, if you gave rainwater warnings then, then why didn't we get rainwater warnings now? That's my question on this one. It goes on to say the thyroid estimate is very conservative and does not consider intervention actions like distribution of potassium iodide, removing dairy cows from contaminated pastures, or interdicting milk or leafy vegetables contaminated with iodine-131. And might I note, again, here's the mention of potassium iodide where they are admitting that it is of benefit in certain circumstances. Well, right after the meltdown, the... Surgeon General came out, and when, and when questioned on 
I believe it was mainstream news. I, I remember seeing the, the, the lady being questioned, and she said, well, it wouldn't probably be a bad idea to get some potassium iodine. Then within an hour, she had to come back out and totally retract it. Well, we see they don't require the plants to have it to disperse it. I heard that some may begin to carry it now, but clearly in the documents in a number of places, I mean, they're picking up their, their potassium iodine before they even go over there. The Japanese are requesting we send some over there. Here it is right here saying, consider intervention actions like distribution of potassium iodine could lower the doses. So there's clear evidence right there. They're being very deceptive and trying to downplay the severity and the fact that, hey, the least you need in a meltdown, if you live within 70 kilometers, that's the least you need potassium iodine. I've seen the plume models, and I've posted them up, and a plume went straight towards Tokyo, 70 kilometers of the, the heavy density radioactive material. So it's very real, and you really need these. I've got my potassium iodine here, and that's just in case there's some massive number of melts, but who knows what could happen over here in the States. We are in a very... Uh, shady, sketchy situation now that no one's addressing the spent fuel pools. The next screen capture titled Flyover and Rooftop Grab in the U.S. AMS flyover data is not expected to be received until sometime tomorrow due to weather forecast conditions. The last set of flyover data from the DOE NIT SITREP situation report, I believe is what that means, was provided on 3-2011, the 20th of March, at 6:21 Eastern Standard Time. Again, here's more indication that the AMS flyover data, they're doing flyovers, so they can't say we weren't testing, they can't say we weren't mobbing, they can't say we didn't talk about a plume or didn't know about a plume. They can only try to rig the RADNET monitors and downplay the level of radiation and test for only iodine or something that has a really short half-life, right? That seems to be the strategy and the, the ta some of these tactics involved. Senonofre provided an Anofre, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Anofre provided an air sampling update on the 20th of March at 1905 EDT. One hour counting time of a 24 hour sample yielded, and it gives a number. Uh, in Pico Curie's uh, iodine-131, and no other isotopes, it says. <laughs> no other isotopes, that's laughable to me. Okay, because these nuclear plants are very sensitive, and they have to know and detect any, and you would think all sorts of isotopes, and if something comes out of that actual plant just to protect the people there. Okay, I'm going to stay focused, and I'm not going to get off on it. The previous report, from the 19th, that would be, what, a day before, provided an air sample that yielded, and they give their super low pico curies of iodine-131 and no other isotopes. Measurements on 318 yield and so on and so forth, which was below the lower limit of detection. Palo Verde generating station provided values for samples, and it goes on to give these, you know, iodine grabs, and they're all extremely low and innocuous and nothing to worry about here, although, and as I systematically go back to these documents, we'll get to the a guy that says, here's my brief for our employees, and here's what you send up the chain of command. And it's clearly two different things, clearly two different things. Next screen capture. Oh, that's a good one. Plume estimates are considered extreme worst case scenarios. Results to be discussed at 321 White House meeting. Prep call was held 320 at 1930. NARAC, they do the modeling, in the process of performing a trans-Pacific dose assessment for the United States using the worst case MELCOR, M-E-L-C-O-R in parentheses, using the worst case source term provided by the NRC. NARAC is also planning to revisit the quote-unquote super core trans-Pacific assessment to separate out core and spent fuel pool sources and may need NRC assistance for that quickly in this you know, front section that I boxed in and highlighted here, you know, we're talking about plume, we're talking about worst case scenarios, talking about White House meetings, talking about NARAC modeling, trans-Pacific doses. Yeah, just going to say that and move on. Continuing to work with DOE, NIT, and NARAC to refine estimates of radiological effects on the United States. Obtaining information from U.S. power plants to monitor and promptly alert the NRC if radiological changes are detected at their sites. Need to follow up with the liaison team to contact the EPA 
to follow up on their monitoring efforts along the western U.S. coastline. And indeed, we all know their monitoring efforts were rigged RADnet monitors. I've got a screen capture still from the Alexander Higgins article that was very well put together that showed clearly um, and coherently the fact that the monitors were recalibrated and they over recalibrated them. So they showed a lesser level than prior to the Fukushima disaster, which we know is completely bogus, completely bogus. Uh, let's see, there's something else I want to mention here. And that's the, it says obtaining information from U.S. power plants to monitor and promptly learn the NRC. Later we'll see evidence that NEI is collecting that data, inserting into a password protected database, and only certain agencies and people are allowed to access that data. Now that may very well be the realistic data that's coming they're trying to suppress. But as far as NEI is concerned, I see mentioned in here, they kind of talk down about NEI and don't really hold them much in very high esteem. At least certain uh, characters in here uh, speak in, in a kind of occasionally in condescending terms of some of these other agencies. Okay, my next screen capture, I have my notes, DOE monitoring system and Navy. I have underlined a section here, the Department of Energy aerial monitoring system assessments support the recommendation for evacuation of U.S. citizens within 50 miles. Prior to Fukushima, they didn't but go out to 10 miles. That's my understanding. The NARAC only goes to 50 miles. And one of the others, the DITRA, I think, only goes to 1,000. So you know, not only at the time of the thing to mention that they don't have a modeling that's prepared to go around the world. Other places do. NILU is putting models out before they shut them down. Dutch Sense was posting them up, and I was going there and screen capturing them too. So I know it's possible. You know, and here's the evidence, again, that not only aerial monitoring system, but this 50-mile evacuation. They know it's damn serious to go 50 miles. And that was, the, that was the catalyst to cause these Friends of the Earth and Federation of Scientists, or I can't remember now, the three big ones that initially, Associated Press did too, but these others that filed, maybe it was uh, the Nuclear Institute Resource Service, maybe they were one, but they... These are ones that would file for freedom of information and maybe actually do something about it. Others were filing like the Associated Press, but no, they didn't really talk about the thyroid doses of children in California. We didn't expect them to, right? But we expected that of the alternative media, though, and they didn't really dig in like I have. Now, I also underline the protective measure team is quote-unquote bounding reasonable model working with Navy and DOE just wanting to know that our good friends at DOE are working with the Navy, the good old boys down at Navy and the Navy nuclear reactors. These guys are all, again, it's powering naval vessels, this whole nuclear power thing. And they cannot allow a, a, a true light to be shine on this failed industry. In my opinion, you know, there's other methods to power these these craft, and they know that. But if you look at these other methods, well, it's something that if the people find out about it, maybe we didn't need gasoline cars after all. You know, maybe there's other methods of, of producing power other than through gasoline and these, uh, these methods that they monopolize and, and sell to us at such a high, unreasonable rate. Now, my next screen capture, DOE aerial monitoring in Unit 3. I always try to keep track of Unit 3 and any references to that, people, because that's where the MOX fuel was. And as we know, the Tennessee Valley Authority is wanting to use MOX fuel, and they're, they're wanting to do that because my understanding is Russia is not mining uranium or as much uranium anymore, and there is a shortage of uranium. And a substitute is you can make the MOX fuel and mix the plutonium. At least that's my crude understanding now. And when new information comes to light, I update my, my rhetoric. I'll put it that way. Okay, I have underlined here, highest dose rates found the Unit 3 reactor building. DOE aerial monitoring system assessments. Again, DOE is doing aerial monitoring clearly. And Unit 3, big time high dose rates. In fact, later you'll see it's very difficult for them to get in there logistically and make um, that repair the, the damaged uh, areas of the nuclear plants. Okay, on my next clip I have highlighted some indications of trace but detectable amounts of I-131, that's iodine-131, are being reported at some nuclear plants in the U.S., Jenna and Nine Mile. Region 1 is being asked to get more detail, and later you'll see other plants will join that list that we're detecting 
uh, radiation here from Fukushima. These were increased levels following the Fukushima meltdowns. And later, we, like I say, we'll find they're downplayed. And, but to note, the fact is that they, they do admit they are detecting them, and that's important for us to keep that in mind. Again, we'll use our science to determine the actual effects and not the moneyed, powered establishment interests who we know will sit there right on stage and Romney will tell you the nuclear power is clean energy. And that's absolutely not the case. And I would challenge Romney to debate on that anytime, anywhere, because he will never stand in an open, free, but sure in a scripted debate like in America. And we just got shafted. The votes weren't counted right in Prop 67. I'm looking to it. Okay. But... Even that to the side, Romney's up there projecting this false illusion in this controlled environment, and, and Obama just sits quiet and doesn't say anything. You know, of course, he can. Think about Plumgate happened on his election. Of course, he got away with it, but we'll try to correct that in the future and, and, and form a system of independent network of people who can get the information out. And, and as I well can see, that is beginning to form in the underground independent media through certain elements. Okay, at the bottom I have... We actually have an underlined midway electrical power has been restored to the Unit 3 control room. And I underline that because here it is, March 23. So that would be 12 days following the tsunami and earthquake. Right, 12 days to get power back on in the control room. So think about that. You can spray it with water cannons. You can hit it with seawater. You can, we'll talk about, inject it with boric acid. You know, if your last case, worst case scenario but there's no easy fix when there's a catastrophic incident like this. Some indications of trace but detectable amounts of I-131 are being reported at some nuclear plants in the U.S. Jenna, Nine Mile, Kiwani, Songs, and Diablo Canyon. Protective Measures Team is reviewing data sets. Requested in our R assistance in reviewing information, and it goes on, so on, so forth. Wait a minute. It does say similar to what was done. I should finish this up. Assistance in reviewing information notice on industry data collection similar to what was done following the Chernobyl accident in 1986. Again, reference to Chernobyl and data from Chernobyl. So folks, when they tell you they don't know about Chernobyl or only 50 people died in it, well, we find out in these documents that they know better than that. Right? And of course, it goes inaudible during the times when they're stating the numbers, but you see two people disagreeing with that figure of 50 fatalities in Chernobyl. We know it's over 900,000 cancer deaths now if you go to the independent studies. Again, if you go to the monet monetary establishment outlets and institutions and foundations and their scientists, it's always, you know, the sky is red and up is down and black is white. And that is consistently, you will find that throughout, and, and I can consistently debunk a lot of their, these illusions they're trying to project, like the fact that it's clean energy, well, they call it a byproduct, but the spent fuel pools are the waste product. In my opinion, it's really a waste product. You have no use for it, and they're not making any preparations to store it in one safe facility like Yucca Mountain. So now we have spent fuel pools on top of buildings, Mark 1 containers all over the place, right? So this is the series. They don't want you to know this in these documents. You'll hear reference to the FOIA documents or the Fukushima disaster, but they're not going to. They don't want to tell you all this, people. They really don't. They want us just, just to keep our heads down and going about our business like nothing's happening. Meanwhile, people are actually getting cancer over here and getting sick. Listen to Nuked Radio and listen to Radchick and listen to her health, physical health condition. And she was outside during the worst of the plume. A lot of us were. I was out that week. The week Obama was in South America. I remember my skin tingling out back in my backyard. And looking back at that, I, I feel fairly certain that's what that was. And later, as I learned more and more and thought back on that, I feel pretty confident because Florida got hit pretty hard if you look at the actual uh, depositions from some of these leaked TEPCO documents. Because a lot of people were modeling, and a lot of people have a good idea what we got hit with. Okay, next screen capture. White House clearance to share model with Japan and potassium iodine mentioned again. DOE has agreed the U.S. should reach out to Japan as one voice only. Again, they want one voice. They want everyone aligned, and you see that word aligned a whole lot in here. Reach out to Japan as one voice only. To facilitate this, DOE, excuse me, Pete Lyons and Steve Aoki 
were provided a summary of the 1000 industry consortium call. In addition, NRC slash RES will participate in a DOE call every day from 1700 to 1800. This will help facilitate the one voice. Chairman is continuing to work with others to establish a senior level person as a focal point. Okay, focal point, one voice, and keeping things aligned. Lots of talking points, press releases. You can go to their website and see their press release. But again, it's like the debate with the presence. You can't really ask about chemtrailing or harp electromagnetic engineering or depleted uranium being dumped overseas or the 5,200 Pentagon pedophiles or the 7,800 veterans with RFID chips implanted in their brains by the CIA at the Army base without their permission. You can't ask them about those things. You can ask them. You can ask Hillary Clinton if she prefers diamonds or gold. Okay? I don't mean to get distracted, but I have to clarify some of these things. This is the big picture. It's all over the place, right? Fascism, not just industry, politics. Politics, industry. It's everywhere. Probably in entertainment as well. Probably a fascist entertainment industry if I really looked into it. NARIC, run on most plausible case, needs to be coordinated before release. Current source term will be updated with most current information on plant status. Based on coordination with DOS, they are waiting for White House clearance to share modeling results with the Japanese government through Ambassador Ruse. Again, pretty hardcore fascism when before Japan can get the... I mean, is someone in the White House an expert? Because NARIC and DOE and NRC, look, if, if, if they're, they have that lack of experience that some of the White House has to make the call on it, you know, I, I can't believe that. I believe it's more, it's, it's control of information. The White House says, you let us know what's going on, and we'll let you know what you can say. All right? That's pretty clear to me. INPO slash DOE has accepted action to figure out how to remove spent fuel from the site. The Japanese provided a list of the things they would accept, including the million doses of potassium iodine, KI, bottled water, RAV monitoring equipment, robotics, and remote control equipment. DOD and DOE lead, Department of Defense and Department of Energy lead. Very crucial there. Those two are hand-in-hand, -hand, folks. Let me tell you, old-school cronyism, fascism right there, militarism, too, if I really got to go there. There will be an actual list with parties identified developed March 25. This is a really good screen capture here and just shows the really sums up the whole thing. Japanese can't even get a plume model until they say it's, you know, don't you think it's important? They should know immediately as soon as possible. And aren't your agencies competent enough to you just have them? You know, this is the craziest thing and it's channeling of information. This is rerouting that information is what it is. Because it's not efficient and it's not accurate when you do it that way. And again, at the bottom, admission, including a million doses of potassium iodine. I'm busted, busted. The NRC is so busted on this. Look, they know we need it, and we know we need it. Let's stop playing games, shall we? Let's grow up and be adults and not play these games. Seriously, just be honest with us. We can handle it. We know nuclear power is a failure and it's all over the place, right? We can handle it. Just tell us what we already know. Okay, the next screen capture uh, is again shows the all of the particular plants at this point. It's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven now. Jenna, Nine Mile, Palo Verde, Songs, Diablo Canyon, Columbia, and Millstone are detecting radiation over here, and they will admit to that. Industry has agreed to collect the data and provide to NRC for distribution with federal government. Anticipate EPA lead. Again, EPA is going to grab that information, make sure it doesn't go anywhere, but you know, to be contained within their, the federal family, especially these particular agencies that are in the lead on some of these things in particular areas. Some in Japan are the lead, some over here are the lead, but either way, the information is going to be routed through, and ultimately the White House, if it's a serious plume model or some serious revelation, they are going to approve or disapprove of it being distributed to the press. Next screen capture. NRC met with representatives from the National Emergency Management Association, NEMA. It's not FEMA, but this is the national, I mean, just one more acronym agency that we don't need, I'm sure. NEMA, though, I hadn't heard of them before. Met with NEMA regarding ongoing business, EPA rulemaking update. The state emergency directors uniformly expressed the desire for a federal official to serve as the focus 
for USG, United States government, messaging on the potential health effects to U.S. states and territories. NRC understands that DOE is taking this role. However, a POC point of contact has not yet been identified. The Nuclear Energy Institute has volunteered to provide the NRC with environmental sampling data from U.S. nuclear power plants. The NRC is sharing this information with the EPA, who is the central point of contact for this information. The public U.S. radiation monitoring data, RADnet, is posted on EPA's public website. We know those monitors were rigged and downplayed. And here's NEI, who's going to be a really nice guy and come and say, hey, we're going to go to the nuclear power plants. Don't you worry. We're going to collect the data from them, and we're going to bring it back to NRC. Uh, NRC will share with EPA, who's a central point of contact for this information. Now, the NEI, I'm certain I read a report from theirs where they, they laughed at the Manganus Tooth Fairy study, which I found to be actually quite credible and the methodology to be rational and sound. So when you look at the Manganus study and see the NEI just totally, you know, turning their nose down at it, well, at that point I said, hey, who are these guys that, that you know, laugh logic right in the face, you know, in a, a rational, sensible scientific study? As the teeth of the children, the babies are tested, the closer to the plant, the levels of strontium rise and grow higher and higher. And that kind of disputes the Cold War era bomb testing fallout that they try to, any I try to promote since as well, it's just from the bomb testing fallout. No, it can't be because as you get closer to the plant, this is in Turkey Point and Miami was one of the instances where clearly you could see the closer to the plant, the higher level of strontium 90 in the baby's teeth. So that really, for me, discredits any eye. And again, I say, for me, you only really get one chance if you're a big a big outlet like that. No, you can't make a big mistake like that and tell me it's an accident. At that point, you've, I've discredited you, and your information and any information that comes from you is, is I'm to be skeptical at the very least, at the very least. Again, that's these monetary establishment interests I'm speaking of. Highly financed, highly funded, they have everything to gain and everything to lose if nuclear power is shut down, as it should be. Next screen capture I've titled, it's from March 29th, Zeolite Unit 4 and Dose Rates. TEPCO plans to inject water into Unit 1 spent fuel pool from cement pumper truck on the 30th of March. Lightning return to lighting, I'm sorry, lighting return to Unit 4 control room, currently no access due to dose rate. So they've got Unit 4 power back up in the control room, but you can't go in there. The dose rate is so incredibly high, incredibly high. And remember, that's where the spent fuel pool ran dry. Despite what Japan tried to convince NRC officials of, they disagreed and said, no, we don't see any water. And in fact, we're wondering if the spent fuel pool is even still intact. At some point, they were wondering if it was pieces of broken or cracked or it was so bad there really wasn't much of a spent fuel pool even left, you know. So you can get the power back on, but it's not going to do you any good if structurally the place is so damaged beyond any, you know, where you can't bring any cohesiveness back to it. It's just pieces. It's rubble. And we have to keep in mind that this planet is geologically unstable. All right? Do you feel lucky? You have to ask yourself that. TEPCO is considering spraying zeolite on the outside and interior of the RX buildings in an effort to minimize resuspension of fission products in the air, but having difficulty planning application due to the elevated dose rates. Again, the best laid plan becomes obsolete under extreme dose situation. Highly radioactive water, approximately 100 rem per hour, found in a quote-unquote trench, pipe and cable chase outside Unit 2, source of water unclear. TEPCO stated that this water is not flowing into the ocean, though the water will overflow this trench if it rises about one meter. And yes, later it would overflow, and it goes all sort of stuff going out in the ocean in the documents. We'll read that in a second. There is water in the trenches outside of Units 1 and 3 as well. Actions have been taken or are in progress to preclude contaminated water in trenches from reaching the ocean, e.g., in other words, they're going to use sandbags, is what they're saying, in other words, sandbags. NEI serving as focal point for collecting U.S. nuclear plant monitoring data. This is the next screen capture. NEI is serving as focal point for collecting U.S. nuclear plant monitoring data in environmental samples and is developing an online database and data from U.S. plants. 
NEI database is available and being populated. NRC and other agencies have read access. And later you'll see where it becomes password only. You'll have to have a password to get into it. Underline this section also as revisions to the severe accident management strategies are being considered in light of Unit 2 and Unit 3 containment conditions and environmental release concerns. And I thought that was important because here again is mention of Unit 3, the unit that's used MOX fuel. And we're talking about Unit 3 containment conditions and environmental release concerns. The PMT Protective Measures Team evaluated information from TEPCO and NISA, NISA regarding levels of plutonium sampled on site. The levels, 5.4 times 10 minus 1 becquerels per kilogram, are very low and below background levels applicable to the eastern range of the Rocky Mountains, quote in parentheses, in the U.S. Well, folks, something down there was making it so hot the workers refused to go in. So hot they had to use bulldozers to push dirt over and cut the rims down. So hot they continually talk about, and we'll talk about mock sludge in a minute, problems going in because of the mocks, problems going in because of the high rad levels, the high rim levels. And for them to sit there and try to, and they know all this is for you documents. They know it's all going to be recorded. They know all their conversations are recorded. This is standard par for the course when it comes to the NRC. So all of this, they're very careful to downplay. I'm, and again, it's my opinion. I can't prove this, but I strongly suspect all of these rooftop grabs and these sample levels, especially if it's coming from TEPCO. I mean, we, TEPCO is with the original main, most hardcore liars of them all. We can at least give, have reason to suspect they're all downplayed to a large extent. And the reality, we don't know for certain what that would be, but just from studying the cover-ups from Three Mile to Chernobyl to the BP incident, we find out they're always downplaying to a large extent. I've even got a video on YouTube I think it's something about Obama and the plume, plume gate or something like that. And there's a clip from any news where the doctor says that there are some government studies which are always downplayed, he says, that there will be 200,000 cancer fatalities from Fukushima. So he, he's a doctor right there telling me the studies are downplayed and it's going to be a lot more than 200,000, right? And he's talking over here in the U.S. Okay, the next screen capture. NEI is collecting U.S. nuclear plant environmental monitoring sample data and has made an online database available for reviewing by NRC and other agencies. Again, there's that database, and we're going to get to the password. It's in here somewhere in just a second. Or discussion of the password. We don't get the password ourselves, obviously. U.S. ambassador in Japan requests for a forward-looking pessimistic scenario calculation. The ambassador is saying, hey, give me something more pessimistic. This is this is gravy here. It's got to be much worse than this, much worse than this. Can you give us a little bit of reality? Well, maybe it's hinging on the White House approving it, you know, which is pretty sad. The meltdown happened in Japan. You would think there would be total transparency in this attempt to work together and, and, and solve this horrible disaster, or at least trying to can contain and maintain. PMT Protective Measures Team has discussed with DOE slash NIT and with NARAC. Request has been forwarded to White House to gain alignment prior to moving forward. Well, there you go. Source term will be developed with RES staff to more accurately reflect changes for decay and events since the beginning of event. Some of these acronyms, folks, I've got to get in and get a more definition. I'm going to find out what they're talking about here. But clearly you can see that, A, the ambassador of Japan is wanting a more pessimistic and, I suspect, realistic scenario calculation. And meanwhile, the request is forwarded to the White House to gain alignment prior to moving forward. In other words, they got to prove it. they got to prove it's election cycle. Remember, Obama's getting elected again, or trying to. Well, he did, right? And even though they're a <laughs> very sketchy election. I won't go into that tonight, though. It's another show, broadcast. Okay, next screen capture. Protective Measures Team is working with RST, uh, that's the uh, team, reactor something, or a safety team. PMT is working with RST to determine an estimate of the water level in the unit four spent fuel pool in order to determine the source term. Again, we're talking about unit four, 
and the water level, which we clearly see in, in the other docket, the 507 pager we looked at, they talked in there about for sure that it was there's no water. And if there is, it's just barely enough to make a reflection, according to the Japanese, must have had a really good eyes. HHS and indicated that KI would be shipped out to Japan on April 1st. So here's Health and Human Services indicating it. That's who HHS is, right? Indicated that KI, potassium iodine, would be shipped out to Japan. Why aren't they stored at every nuclear plant? Why isn't there a system to immediately distribute that potassium iodine in the event of a meltdown? Why? Iodine is one of the big ones that's released, and it does stay local, and its half-life isn't that long, but within those first week or couple of weeks until the it cuts it down 50% or you want it longer than that, you really want to take that stuff. So it's patently ridiculous and absurd for them to tell us we don't need it, and their excuse is, well, there's other stuff released too. It would only protect against iodine. Well, that's, you know, that's one down. That's one down however many to go. And if you're shipping it over there, it's good for them, but not good for us. Again, in these documents, a lot of this hypocrisy is clearly uncovered and exposed, and this could be used as a tool to le a leverage against the nuclear power industry and to inform the, that first herd of sheeple out there that are, they have no clue. But if they had a clue, again, we can try to get people's attention and put pressure on people to begin. It takes 10 years to get it into dry cast, is my understanding, so we better get cracking, folks. Now, at the bottom of this clip also, it says a Japanese newspaper has reported that simulations were done more than 30 years ago at Oak Ridge National Laboratory that reasonably matched conditions at the Fukushima nuclear plant based on a loss of power at the Browns Ferry nuclear plant, which is a Mark I containment plant. So you can see that a newspaper in Japan is reporting that 30 years ago we did simulations. 30 years ago we knew it would happen. So we, the information already existed. Now you've got Three Mile to talk about Chernobyl, to talk about Oak Ridge, um, where they did a, a, a simulation back in the day. So they have plenty of information. I can't find any excuse for them, to be honest with you. I wish it wasn't so. I wish we weren't a fascist country that didn't care about the lives of children over industry. But unfortunately, the nuclear industry vastly outweighs the lives of the women and children of this country. Mental to the side, men aside, they don't care. They don't care about the women and children of this country. And that's a fact. I'm not going to get distracted to go off on it, but that's uh, that's a fact. You can conclude nothing else. Okay, the next screen capture. Supported chairman's attendance at the principal's meeting. Some external concern, DOD, NRC, that a diverging perspective may have inadvertently been developed through various communications. This particular issues appear to be addressed regarding the, quote, current severity and need for expediency, end quote, of implementation of the U.S. recommended SAMG actions. Now, I don't know what the SAMG actions are, but just from the very beginning of this little section, you can clearly see, they again, this whole alignment thing, one voice, one, you know, if you're going to lie, you've got to get your lie straight, and everyone has to have the same lie. If there's a diverging perspective, okay, that inadvertently, I'm sure they're saying, through various communications. Well, I'm sure people are talking, and look, I have to be honest with you. I'm certain people within the NRC are really worried, and some of them will leak stuff out. Some might make some phone calls. Some might, you know, anonymously report to their family or friends or whoever and say something. Well, not anonymously their family or friends, but, you know, get to try to get the word out. I'm convinced of that. There's a leaked plume model with an NRC logo on it that they're worried about getting contained and getting taken down off the website. So, you know, my opinion, again, is, and there's certainly evidence of this in the documents, that not all NRC is down with the program of hiding from the American public what's going on. I think some of them probably had naive, like I did when I entered the alternative media, naive expectations of what they were getting into. And then when you get there, you really find a low, down, dirty underbelly of what these industries and what these certain things are like. So what you thought it was and what it really is are two different things. But nevertheless, some people won't completely compromise, and they try to leak some stuff out there, the, you know, the whistleblowers and the light shiners out there trying to give us information. I certainly think anyone who's been able to leak information out to us and help us out. Also goes on to say the Unit 1 containment inerting effort has been postponed for several days, originally planned for Thursday, 31 March. I believe that's what the board asked that they inject it when they talk about inerting the 
containment, while TEPCO continues to evaluate the best means for accomplishing this task. High radiation level in this area is a factor for the delay. Okay, again, just keeping it real there, what it's really like during a catastrophic meltdown. You can't just waltz back in there, oh, though we wish we could, and just drive a fire truck in there and start hosing it down and hook the generators up and everything's fine. It's, it never works that way. Okay, on the next screen capture, the White House briefed the states regarding the event on 4 11 at 1,800 hours. Other federal agencies participated in the briefing, including DOE, NOAA, EPA, and CDC. The liaison team, LT, and the OPA, Office of Public Affairs, listened in on the call. Listened in on the call. There were no questions directed to the NRC. And so this one I thought was important. Because the White House is running the show. They're briefing the states, okay, regarding the event, the Fukushima catastrophe. And we see what came of that, folks. No warnings here. While other countries got warnings, we got warnings during Chernobyl, which they say that Fukushima is 10% of Chernobyl, but yet that doesn't ring true at all. None of that makes any sense at all, folks. Why didn't we get any warnings here? Next screen capture. NARAC has not undertaken the analysis. The protective measures team was informed that NARAC is waiting on a task from the White House before proceeding. And you know, when you look at these screen captures and you read the documents, this one in particular, this one has a redaction that has been done to it, but it's been removed. And I'm not familiar with these programs and how this works where you can redact using this software program and maybe undo what you did. But I thought it was interesting that some of these are highlighted as if saying, hey, this section is to be redacted, but for whatever reason, it never was. Well, it's very incriminating once you study the meltdowns and what happens afterwards, the cost and consequences of Chernobyl and the Sherman Mangano study and what have you, then you really get a good idea. And you know the White House is controlling and, and downplaying everything. It's very incriminating on our White House and our and the federal government, no doubt about it. It's really an eye-opener and was an eye-opener for me. And I thought I had awakened at that point, but I got a whole nother level of awakening when I dug into these documents and realized that level of deceit and conspiracy and the fact that they don't care if thousands of us die and won't even issue a rainwater warning because why? It would look bad on the nuclear industry and it would give people reason more leverage to try and you know bring an end to this whole thing, nightmare scenario. Okay, next screen capture. Briefing material for Chuck Castro to use with Secretary of State Clinton has been provided. Meeting is anticipated the week of 17 April. Protective measure team, reactor safety team, providing input. So there you go, Secretary of State Clinton, week of 17, 17 April, she's meeting with Castro. Well, he's in deep and he knows a whole lot. All of these characters do. And while they may know they're being recorded because of freedom of information, and, and then even though there's redaction, they're very careful to, to not reveal too much in these conversations. Nevertheless, there's an, enough to piece together this giant conspiracy, and part of that is Secretary of State Clinton going overseas to help do damage control and then you know, continuing to ship Japanese seafood and what have you over here from Japan. There's mention in here about some, uh, it's like an economic, J Japan economic team they're putting together to try to make sure Japan's economy, because think about it, they're so much relies on their seafood industry and what have you that this disaster really should have, in all reality, I don't know, what the solution is, but if you think about it, you just can't be shipping radioactive food around the world. It was your choice to have nuclear power, and now you're paying the price for it. Why are we being shipped radioactive food over here just to keep your economy alive? That's it. It's suicidal in nature that you're going to suicide anyway, but now you want me to suicide with you by eating your radioactive food. That, to me, is just crazy. Okay, next screen capture. OPA, Office of Public Affairs, will host two producers from the CBS 60 Minutes show in the Op Center on 414 around 1 p.m. Well, there's your connection to the mainstream media live, right? And if you ever watch CBS 60 Minutes, folks, they're owned by the military-industrial complex. Owned. Owned. CBS. Owned by the military-industrial complex. That's right. The Laura Logan lady, the, the pretty blonde that's selling you the drones and how drones are. No, man. Don't fall for that at all. 
those people are as evil as evil can be. There's no doubt about it. That's my opinion, but I'm pretty darn certain on that, folks. Okay, next screen capture. FSME now has the lead on the 2000 Health and Human Services call with 50 states and federal partners. Mark Schaefer at IAEA, International Atomic Energy Association, I believe that's correct, has requested permission to share the NRC FITREP situation report with the Chinese government. OIP, Kirk Foggy, Steve Bloom are working. NRC FITREP with the Chinese government. Kirk Foggy, Steve Bloom are working on that FITREP. Followed up with an email to Steve and Kirk at 0300 on 416 advising against sharing a document that U.S. states and other international stakeholders have been denied. Let me go back through that real quick one more time because I kind of bungled that. But basically what it's saying is uh, the call with 50 states and federal partners, this one particular place has a lead. Again, there's the control and, and routing of information, right? They want to make sure these 50 states are all getting the same story. you got to get your lie right, right? And then Mark Schaefer, he was requesting permission, and this follows up in another, a couple other clips, where they deny his ability to, to share it. He's requesting permission. He wants to share the situation report with the Chinese. I mean, the Chinese aren't that far away, right? And so they, you would think they have a right, right to be given accurate, timely information in order to protect their human beings over there, right? For crying out loud. Followed up with an email to Steve and Kirk advising against sharing a document, the document he's talking about, that U.S. states and other international stakeholders have been denied. So they're saying we can't give it to China. We haven't given it to the states. The U.S. states aren't even given this document. When the, the other stakeholders, the other nuclear power plants, they're not getting hold of this either. We don't, again, we don't want to freak the states out. We don't want to freak the other stakeholders, the other nuclear plant operators around the world. We want to cover it up. We want to downplay it. We want to minimize it. And we're going to, we're going to, you do our best, to, and they put the spin on it. Let's put a spin on it and say we're going to learn from this, and we've learned from this as a good thing in the end because we've learned from this. And then next time it won't be so bad, you know, and maybe five meltdowns later we'll have it all worked out, right? Senator Markey's office, one outstanding question, quote, was there a pressure vessel rupture on Unit 2? Throughout this document, Senator Markey is, has asked a number of questions, and the one they're worried about is he wants to know is there a vessel rupture on Unit 2, and clearly they say, hey, forward the analysis by email to OCA to follow up with Senator Markey's staff, and you know, they say, what are we going to do about this guy's question? He's kind of pestering them, and they say right here, ET, executive team, requested advice from OCA on how to proceed. So they want to get touch bases with their bosses and say, hey, this guy's center is asking a question. Let me get with you before I proceed and answer him. Don't want to get into trouble by maybe saying something I shouldn't have said, right? Okay, next screen capture. Slides on interim comprehensive safety assessment, TEPCO quote-unquote roadmap. Interesting. And METI statement sent to commission assistance. Unit 3, using robots to ascertain radiation, temperature, and damage in plants. Ambassador Roos provided Sec Secretary Clinton with NRC quick look comments on roadmap. And that roadmap here, it's saying right here, interim comprehensive safety assessment. That's what that is. It's a comprehensive safety assessment. Well, if that was the truth and accurate, at that time, Clinton really got her mind blown with the severity of the situation. Okay, next one is a good one here. TEPCO is considering adding boric acid to the core cooling water, 419, on the 19th of April. TEPCO is considering one in two men of the Unit 2 reactor building to stop leakage believed to be emanating from the suppression pool. Two, trying to ascertain whether the water in the Unit 2 basement may be coming from another unit. Three, requesting U.S. assistance and expertise with processing high-level rad waste, and four, inerting Unit 3 dry well, however difficult due to high rad level levels and debris in the area. So Unit 3, again, high rad levels, debris. Of course, they say, well, we sampled the plutonium, and it's less than the West Coast Cold War bomb era rads, you know. So, phew, folks, something's not adding up there. If it weren't for us meddling kids, would anybody even know about this at all? You know, I feel like I'm a Scooby-Doo mystery van riding around trying to solve this mystery, folks. 
Okay, and boric acid, I got a thing on that that I was reading tonight, and again, I'm a layman, I'm not an expert, but it seemed to me that if you're injecting boric acid, you're pretty desperate at that point because from my understanding is you have to add just so much boric acid at a time to help reduce the criticality and the reaction in your nuclear reactor. If you wanted to slow the reaction, you would add more boric acid up to a point. If you add more than however many parts per million, then you're offsetting the chemical reaction or the particulars of it, and things can go wrong, is what I was reading. So it seems to me if you're to that level, you're going to inject you know, boric acid and try to inert something. Again, very severe, very, very, very severe meltdown. There's no other way around it. They can't downplay it. And with severe meltdowns, plural, this is a plural meltdown, and it's spent fuel pool number four. We know it didn't have water in it for how long? How long? Long time, folks. A lot of radiation. Okay, here's my quick Well, I do have a thing on my boric acid. Boric acid and inorganic acid is a white powder or transparent crystallized substance that is soluble in water. In nuclear power reactors, boric acid is dissolved in the reactor coolant and used as a soluble reactive control agent. Boric acid in nuclear power plants is to control the speed of nuclear fission. In general, the amount of neutrons determines the speed of fission as the boron absorbs the neutrons. B10, one of boron's isotope, is a good neutron absorber. Normally, B10 in the form of boric acid exists in the reactor to control the speed of fission. Boric acid, after being prepared in the REA system, enters the CVCS system through the RCV loop. That's some more technicalities there. Down at the bottom, it also says, boric acid functions as a chemical shim. At the beginning, reactor's positive reactivity is strong, so BA's concentration is high. As reaction proceeds, the concentration of BA goes down and the reactor is in criticality. If there is an accident, high concentration BA can be injected and reactor will start the negative reaction. It will reduce the reaction. BA's concentration influences the temperature coefficient of moderator. When BA's concentration is high, temperature coefficient is positive, which is not good for the operation safety. In order to make sure the reactor safety, the maximum concentration of BA in coolant is 1,400 parts per million when reactor works. So this is advantages of using boric acid to control reactivity. Normally it takes several minutes to regulate the concentration of boric acid via pouring concentrated boric acid or pure water into the primary loop. So this method is slow in controlling reactivity. Okay, so it sounds to me like, well, you're really, it's a last-ditch effort to try to inert and, and pump this stuff in there. And there's no easy solution is all I can say on that. Again, I'm not an expert on this stuff, but clearly, uh, if they're discussing entombing and using boric acid, that I would refer to as, a, as reference to the seriousness of the meltdown. And, and thus, again, there's a plume and fallout that comes with all of these meltdowns, rainwater warnings during Chernobyl here in the United States. Okay, next screen capture. We're getting near to the end of these. The U.S. DOE and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency are the federal communicators for questions regarding possible domestic impacts from the events in Japan and on domestic monitoring. Status of NRC licensee and agreement state facilities, air sampling and standing water sample results from U.S. nuclear plant licensees have been entered into a password protected database established by the Nuclear Energy Institute. NRC and federal partners have access to the plant data. Okay, there it is right there. Meanwhile, the briefs going to the plant employees say something totally different. I've been clear on that. Next screen capture. As of April 14 at 2130 UTC, white smoke was still observed coming from units 2, 3, and 4. And that's IAEA is admitting that. And, and if you're on any &E news, you could watch the live feed. They had a number there, and there's a couple of sites that do that. You can watch the live feed from Fukushima. But... There are some sketchy things about that live feed. Is it like the BP live feed where it's busted looping stuff around and everything? So here's from April 14th. You see that units 2, 3, and 4 are still um, emanating smoke, white smoke, and that's 14th what from the 11th? 
13 days later, look, we should have really, at that point, they knew it was an ongoing, the fallout issue would be ongoing. And we would need to take measures over here, the long-term measures. You, at least that's what common sense would dictate for me at this point. Protective Measures Team Japan reached back to Protective Measures Team headquarters to raise awareness of the quote-unquote waste container and quote-unquote radioactive mock sludge, causing access problem issues on the site. No action at this time. On 421, Commission TAs inquired if any action is being taken to modify the source term. NARIC has been asked to perform more runs with updated release rates recreated from the accidents. So you can see there the waste container and radioactive mop sludge. If they want to bring that stuff over here, I think we need to have a stiff resistance to any kind of use of mop fuel in this country because clearly the evidence here show, shows that when there's any kind of incident with the mop fuel, you have this mop sludge. It's all over the place. We can't send guys in. The rims are too high. Bring out the bulldozers. Humvees with lead plates on them even. Okay, next screen capture. Request from Japan Protective Measures Team to evaluate waste container and radioact radionuclide and mock sludge. They again reference to the mock sludge in that waste container. Mark Schaefer at IAEA has requested permission, here again is about this document in the Chinese, has requested permission to share the NRC SITREP situation report with the Chinese government. OIP is working. OIP was advised this document should not be shared. Concerns with any plan to share the sit rep with the Chinese government are, one, U.S. states have been denied access to this document, and two, if we share the document with the Chinese government, this precedent could obligate us to honor requests from other international stakeholders as well. As we learned from the New York Times article, we need to safeguard against leaks of OUO information. I'm not sure what they mean on the OUO information, but leaks, obviously, leaks of information. Apparently, some New York Times article, I thought that was interesting, too. They've, you know, something happened there or something may have been leaked out. So clearly, they're not going to give this to the Chinese government because doing so, other people they didn't give it to will recognize that, and that's not going to fly. That's not good, uh, good cover-up policy, folks. Okay, and my next clip on this one really is, is the, what I just read to you, but you can see in this, I included this one because you can see where it's been redacted. You can see where lines have been drawn through it. I don't really think this, they wanted this out there. I mean, it's pretty damning that this document's not being shared all the way around and lives are at stake. Who cares about your stupid industry? It's dangerous, it's archaic, and, and people's lives are more important to me, hands down, no questions asked on that one. Okay, next clip. As a NISA notes that while an INES rating of 7 is the same as that of the Chernobyl accident, their current estimated amount of radioactive materials released is approximately 10% of the amount from the Chernobyl accident. Now, there's where I'm quoting that, 10% from the Chernobyl accident, which we know that's ridiculous because if we got rainwater warnings from Chernobyl, right, in Oregon and other states, this is a fact. If you read the cost and consequences of Chernobyl, I hope I'm quoting that title right. I've got a link to that on Uncovering Plume Gate. If you read that, you can clearly see that the rainwater warnings were a reality. Now, if the amount being released is approximately 10% of the amount from the Chernobyl accident, I'm just not buying that, to be honest with you. And we got warnings then, but we're not going to get it now. Thanks. Thinking about the level of detail that might be appropriate for a daily one-page summary of current status for Congress, you might consider something like the following. Okay, I'm right back to the beginning of this thing. That's where I want to. I want to end it right there. Is that correct? Yep, that ends it on that 10% of Chernobyl. I'm trying to palm that off on 10% of Chernobyl. Okay, folks, that's pretty much going to cover it for tonight. I'll come back and look at the Alvarez study with the spent fuel pool situation, uh, which is pretty serious as well, but I've got to read back over that one again and make some notes before we dig into that. And it'll be a couple days before I come back. I've got to, to go through some documents again and do some analysis and try and put things together for another uh, broadcast here. 
So that's going to sum it up for this 86-page document. And I thank everyone for joining me and taking issue with the nuclear power situation and educating and informing yourself. I will post up a heads up next time I have another broadcast, so stay tuned. Thanks for joining me. Over and out.